So hi everyone, I'm Beth Rubey. I'm the uh, Director of Repair and host of the Civics Project. And I wanna welcome everyone to our 28th episode. Can you believe it? 2021 is flying by. Our 28th episode on the subject of youth incarceration and a subject I've been waiting for a while to give some attention to. I'm really thrilled today to be joined by Dominique uh, Nang and Edgar Ibarra Gutierrez. But before we introduce them, I wanted to start with a brief land acknowledgement. Repair acknowledges the Gabriolina Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tawangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Tarahatong, the indigenous peoples in this place. We pay our respects to Hanukvatam, ancestors, Ahihiram, elders, and Iohinkan, our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. As promised, I'm delighted today to introduce two really wonderful guests. So I first want to introduce Edgar Ernesto Ibarra Gutierrez, who is a Chicano indigenous man raised in the city of Watsonville by his mom and his three siblings. He's currently a fourth year student at the University of California at Davis, majoring in communications, and he's the leadership and program coordinator at MILPA where he facilitates culturally rooted leadership development and movement building workshops with young people. That sounds amazing, by the way. Uh, additionally, Edgar's work focuses on supporting young people's civic engagement while they work towards a future where the next generations can thrive with cultural pride and dignity. Edgar has strategically supported efforts at MILPA to dismantle and disrupt the carceral system by challenging and undoing laws and policies that disproportionately impact Black and Indigenous people. I next want to introduce Dominique Nam, who Dominique Dean Nam, who is the Director of Youth Justice Policy for Children's Defense Fund of California. Before joining CDF of California, Dominique was an Assistant Juvenile Public Defender in Baltimore City, Maryland. Previously, as a clinical fellow at Northwestern Law School, Dominique co-taught a juvenile and criminal defense clinic before creating the pretrial representation and corrections policy project, a course dedicated to reducing Illinois' over-reliance on incarceration. Prior to Northwestern, Dominique was a staff attorney at the Southern Poverty Law Center, where she engaged in campaigns to limit transfer of youth to the adult criminal court system challenge the role of police in schools and reform conditions in juvenile prisons. So hopefully the audience can see why I'm really um, excited and honored to have these two brilliant people with us today. And I wanna start our conversation by asking for some background on the juvenile justice system in the United States. What does it look like? How does it function? And Edgar, I know that you have personal experience with the juvenile justice system in California, so I wanna particularly invite you to share with us to do a little storytelling if you would like. Thank you, Beth, for that opportunity. I also want to thank each and every one of y'all for viewing or watching right now from home. Hopefully y'all having a great weekend. Uh, hopefully your family's having a great weekend too. And you know, y'all have food and a good and a good roof over your head and just and full of love, right? The most important and I guess just to share my like my story is not as unique as I would as it, as it is. It's actually pretty common. Uh, specifically in black and brown indigenous communities. Um, I think growing up, I just to provide a little bit of background, I grew up in the city of Watson, which literally uh, between uh, uh, Salinas and Santa Cruz, right? It's the part of South uh, 10, 15 minutes, and uh, it's predominantly agricultural fields. Uh, that's the economy right there, uh, strawberries. So a lot of the times if you all see strawberries, they come from Watsonville. But uh, I grew up with one, uh, just with my mom, and my three siblings, I'm the youngest of four. And uh, when, I, when I was growing up, uh, unfortunately, my father wasn't in the picture because he was incarcerated as well. So I come from a line where our father, uh, in my family in particular, uh, the father figure hasn't been there as my father's father was murdered when he was like about three months old in Mexico. And, and the story continues so on and so forth. But uh, Really just wanted to share that much. So you have a little bit of a context of where I come from and, and, and like who do I represent? My mom, because family comes from Mexicali, my dad's side of the family who comes from a Jalisco. But uh, unfortunately for myself, you know, just growing up, uh, 
always trying to meet uh, my mom was a single parent, two jobs, either the fields or the canneries. Uh, it, was, it was really hard for her. And uh, having to raise four kids on her own, it was it was really difficult. And I, I being the youngest of four, uh, I really didn't listen. I always questioned like, man, why are we like the whole com component of poverty? And I never really understood the whole thing of like, kind of like not having money. And it's like, how can we not have a dollar to buy a bag of chips? And it, it really always, for something when I was a kid, it really bugged me. And, uh, and as I grew up, I just kind of gravitated to some of the stuff that, that was easier for me to distract myself with. It was the street life. You know, there was really nothing at home. We lived in a one room. Uh, studio which imagine three, three or four kids in there with my long time my mom so it's like I'd rather be on the streets and uh, again and just navigating that lifestyle and, and that way just I found myself in trouble with the law and it all started literally in my first time getting uh, arrested was for a fight in, in elementary school I think I was either in third or fourth grade and I had found myself being placed in cuffs because I was being a little bit too too defiant for uh for the principal and the police officer at the time and until my grandmother was able to show up. That was my first kind of running run with, with law enforcement. But to fast forward, I think I was must have been either 12, 13. Um, I, was, uh, what, what I was pulled over and um, made to take my shirt off and, and like in the middle of a busy street. And I was, uh, quote unquote, looking for tattoos and stuff like that to identify me as a potential uh, or future gang member. And that happened real quick. And then next thing you know, years later, I, I come to find out that they still have those pictures of me of when I was a kid. And they have the, the still the card of what gang I would potentially be a part of in the future. But that all leads into kind of the, the story of how I navigated the juvenile justice system. And for myself, I, I started, I was incarcerated at first in Santa Clara County, then transferred back to my, my county of residence, which was Santa Cruz County. And while in Santa Clara County, uh, I was being charged as an adult and I had to, uh, and then my mom at the first time didn't really comprehend the idea or the thought of like, my child's gonna get charged as an adult. And it's like, you're, and you know, she didn't know she had a language barrier, really didn't understand the system, even though having navigating that with my father, I uh, really didn't understand what it looked like for, uh, for a young person. And uh, I remember she kept asking like, why can't they bail, why can't we bail you out? Why can't we bail you out? And my public defender having what's through the interpreter had to tell her like, young people don't get bailed out. You know, and now then, then we'll take it a trial. And there's other things my mom didn't understand, but just navigating the whole component of potentially getting charged as an adult, having, having to go through fitness hearings to see if you can be charged as an adult or, you know, have the capacity of adult like, like mindset. Uh, that, that stuff that, uh, that, that I had to go through my mom and everybody had to kind of get, get hit to the script, understand that the juvenile justice system and how it worked from a court perspective. And, at the time, I was like, I was in Santa Clara County, and, and at the time, when you are facing a 707B offense, or one of those like um, either a, a, a serious or violent crime, as a, a minor in, in that county in particular, they place you in, in segregated units where you don't have as much as free time to move about, right? Uh, based on the, the seriousness of, of your case, and uh, the education system in there as well. It's to be honest, y'all, it was really poor. It, it consisted of packets. Here's a packet. If you can do it, you do it. And, uh, and it's not to say anything against the teachers, but some of the teachers didn't do anything as much as to want to motivate us to educate, to learn about, uh, to learn, or even to see, seek the importance of why we must uh, learn or just educate ourselves, for, right? And um, however, I ended up getting sentenced. I, I, I believe I, I was for a robbery and, and a gang enhancement and a, an assault. And that landed me in what was now, now is the Div division of juvenile justice, which it no longer exists, or I don't know. In theory, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure how all that works. Hopefully, Dominique can help me. But at the time, it was the California Youth Authority, and uh, and the, I took a long ride from Santa Cruz County all the way to uh, Amador, and in, in, um, and in, and in, 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 I believe I believe it was Amador County, and I own Preston. It was called the, the the facility was called Preston. It was in Ion, California, and long. I, I was far long. Far away from home, uh, it was almost like a four-hour drive from Watsonville, and just being there, y'all. To be honest, uh, my first day there, I was a, uh, I got into a scuffle, just trying to be like a knucklehead. Trying, I was a very small kid then. I must have been like five foot one and weighing about like hundred and five pounds, a 14, 15 years old, going on fifteen, and um, so I had to like kind of like see where I was at. And uh, unfortunately, that first day there, I got was sprayed with OC spray, and I remember getting taken down to the ground and. Uh, <laughs> 
and I laugh at it now because it's one of those moments where like, like, damn, it's really happened to me as a young person. Um, I was told, welcome to Preston. And, I, and off I went to solitary confinement for the next 30 days until I was released back to assume a regular uh, kind of just protocol or a reception protocol. And but while, while I was in these institutions of the California, these, the, East, the state youth prisons in California, I think one of the, a lot of things take place here. And I think there were some light bulb moments for me where, where I realized things. And I, I had find myself in, in what we call the whole or se administrative segregation, however they call it now, in solitary confinement. And I remember looking outside the, the tray window, the very the slit, and just kind of like looking down and you can see name tags. And each name tag has a specific color. Uh, and each color represents uh, the ethnicity of a young person. And there was only black and brown, uh, which was pink and green tags, which represent only black and brown. And that was in both sides. And uh, at that moment, I remember thinking like, there's only black and brown kids here and all the guards are white. And I don't know, I really didn't have much of a like an understanding or conscious kind of effort of like what was going on there. But I just knew it wasn't wrong. Uh, it wasn't right. And I sat down and just started thinking but it was also a moment for me to really realize like, what was going on. And, and in, the, in Preston, uh, everybody knows it's like very like rural area. It was open dorm. They had the, the whole settings. Uh, and, and Preston had, if y'all look into Preston, uh, the youth industries or just the, uh, the, that youth prison, it has its own history. Very, very dark history. It was the first place where young people were incarcerated. And, and, uh, and it that feeling, that atmosphere of everybody going through their own traumas, everybody navigating their own hurt, their own pain, it, it, it lingers. And, all, and we're just a bunch of young men who are trying to come into, and, and we're going, going through puberty, coming into our development, however everybody was, and just re reflecting now as I always do, everybody was just dealing with, with, with whatever they, they were dealing. And it's like, again, it's, it's not to put an excuse to our behaviors when we were young, but it was a lot of things, poverty, uh, navigating the foster care system, navigating abandonment, uh, abuse, violent, uh, violent sexual abuse, navigating all these different things. And, and, and it was all masked, all masked through kind of a, a facade either covered in tattoos from face, from head to toe, or, you know, always wanting to walk out, walk around with your chest out just to prove that you were something or someone else. And that, I guess I share I share all these things because it's like in these places they're supposed to be for rehabilitation, but there was just a lot of anger, a lot of sorrow, a lot of uh, just pain there. And one thing I do know is that a lot a lot of the young people that I met there, there there's only these these basic outcomes. One, you were gonna get out and somehow some way figure out life, which was like about three percent of all of us. The other the other four categories consisted of, of going down, getting a addicted and, and, to, and going back to the streets, getting rearrested and coming back to prison, getting killed or committing suicide. And uh, those were the, the actual, uh, what I saw through my friends and through the acquaintances I made and like just hearing about folks, oh, whatever happened to these folks, oh, this is what happened. And, uh, and as I think, and as I he sit here and share this with y'all, it's like, it was a really bad place, y'all. And it's like, again, um, staff or, or correction officers, who were there at times supposed to help us. They were, I, I'm not gonna just generalize everybody. There was some folks there, uh, not many that actually had good intentions. However, the system that be and that was in place didn't allow them to operate in, on that level just because that's what it was. That was their, their norm. You know, they, you can't get too close to these young people. You never know because they might, they might be plotting to get over on you or, or something, right? Uh, so there were some, but the majority of folks, it, they treated it as a regular, uh, 925, uh, this, they disassociated themselves. Uh, they treated everybody just like a number. Uh, they sometimes wouldn't even call you by your last name, uh, wouldn't even afford you that. They'd just call you. And, and, if, and if that was the case and you, you, you were acting out, you were sent to the hole and where you would be actually be put in cages for rec time. And cages consisted of an hour outside of your uh, cell every, uh, every day. For, and uh, you would go out there and back then it can, you were in a paper jumpsuit. Uh, it was up until I think during the, uh, I think some folks, there were some visitors that came by and saw all of us in the cages and people were in paper jumpsuits. It was like middle of November, December, it was super cold. Uh, it, we Everybody knows it's cold because you could see our breath. 
Uh, people were in sandals, people were jumpsuits, and, and you were lucky to have a jacket. And But it all changed after that. But again, y'all, the, the conditions in there and, and just a glimpse of navigating all that, it's uh, it's very traumatic. But even within all that, there's sil silver linings as far as the relationships you're able to build with certain people. When you when you bump into folks out on the streets and, and you see how well they're doing, and it's like, damn, we made it through all that. And uh, but and, and it's like, we made it through all that, but there's still lingering things. It's, it's actually like, it provides this hope, there's strength and, uh, and there's love, you know? Someone that we had a strong support group of, of folks that either we met while we were in there, folks that were waiting for us to come back home, our families, friends, or, or just folks that we met when we came back home that really provided the opportunity for us to thrive. And um, I, I think, uh, you know, as everything, all of, Honestly, as I, again, as I look back and I think back and reflect on what, what I went through during that time, we were all looking for attention and love. That's all we were doing. And um, a lot of the behavior sometimes is that we needed attention and love and we didn't find it, so we found it in a different way. And, but that love component um, is something that a lot of us could have, uh, it could have helped a lot of us. And I know it's not professional to show that to young people. Uh, but man, there were some of us that we were just yearning for that. And, and I think, again, my story is not unique. It, it, there's a lot, it might be a lot of similarities with other folks, but it's still its own little story. And, um, I, and for me, when I think back, you know, it, it's, uh, we were just growing up and looking for attention and love in all the wrong places. And we, we were, unfortunately, we were confined and locked up and Preston, Chad, uh, SR, uh, YTS, all these different uh, uh, state of uh, facilities, and and in those places we kind of came came to age. We got our rights of passage, and, and we learned a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't going to help us when we came back home. We became impulsive. Our our anger was either uh, it, our anger became more, more intensified, and, and there was just different things uh, that happened. But again, silver linings and through all that, uh, folks that came in providing services, uh, help one or two staff who actually really had cared to help. And, um, but sometimes just, just being around folks who like, who were probably going, to, going through the same things uh, also help. And somehow some way we managed, uh, I'm, I'm just fortunate to be here. Uh, like, like when you mentioned Beth, I'm at UC Davis. I, that wouldn't have happened without the help of many different people. Uh, just being able to actually thrive in, a, in, in, a, in an educational setting and navigating the setting and going into my senior year, hoping to graduate. And again, y'all just, I'll say that much, but I can go on forever uh, and don't want to take up time. But uh, I really uh, just wanted to share that much because those are some of the things, again, that I experienced and I went through. Hopefully it made a little bit of sense to y'all back at home and just want to really reinforce the idea of love and affection to these young people who might be going through it, you know? I'll say that much. Palabra. Meeting myself. Edgar, I just want to acknowledge it takes uh, so much spirit and um, love and courage to, to sort of wrap words around experiences that are unspeakable and unbearable. And it is a deeply loving thing to do that because you know that you're giving voice for people who aren't able to articulate. So just want to really honor you in this, in this moment. That was an absolutely incredible narrative. And I'm so grateful for you. And Dominique, I want to ask you to tell our, to give our audience more context. How unique is Edgar's story? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Beth. And sorry, I need a, I need a moment. I, I have the honor of working with Edgar and uh, so many other people who, just brilliant people and beautiful people who have been locked up and have have made it through. And I know the courage and vulnerability it takes. And <clears throat> even though I hear it a lot each time, it kind of, <laughs> uh, it sort of hits me, right? And this is what this is why we we do the work. This is why I do the work. Um, it, you know, a couple of things in listening to Edgar's story is it's, like he said, it, it's, it's not unique at all, unfortunately. Um, you know, on any given night in 2017, there were over 43,000 children and young people who were stripped from their families like Edgar, stripped from everything they know, people they love, and put and forced to sleep somewhere else in a facility, right? And the vast majority of these 
are prison-like facilities like the one described by Edgar. You know, in 2019, just in California alone, there were 16,000 young people who were incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And the thing with what Edgar was saying is even though he spoke in the past tense, right, because he's out here now, the conditions he described are still the same. I was just in um, a, a juvenile facility. It's like a version of a, of a youth jail just last Thursday. Um, and it's not, it's not different neither in California nor, nor across the country. Um, these are places where they look like they're, they are jails, right? And they are, they are prisons. Either they're in open dorms, but a lot of them are in cells. Small rooms, no restrooms most of the time, locked doors, maybe a small window if you've got it, right? Facing out and maybe if you're lucky, facing on the outside, like, like Edgar says, kind of like a tray, like a very thin, a very thin slat. Um, I was talking to young people who, um, actually a young person who was saying he, there was a fight that broke out. So he was locked down. Um, that's protocol in his cell for a full week where 23 hours a day, he's locked in that cell. He comes out for an hour for maybe shower and recreation. Oftentimes it's in um, these recreation sort of cages. There's not one young person I've worked with or talked to um, who didn't say that they didn't just feel like an animal when they were, when they were inside. Um, and when I talk about these, these facilities, um, you know, you have over 43,000, again, statewide or countrywide, nationwide, sorry, I'm still a little affected, um, in 2017, but they're not just in juvenile facilities. There are nearly a thousand who are in adult prisons because Edgar was facing transfer into the adult system. And one of the key things to remember is that there are young people um, who you're under 18 when you are charged with an offense and you can be sent to the adult system. And when you get transferred into the adult system, you can be not only put in adult jails as a young person, you can be held in adult, you can be sentenced to adult prisons and frankly, you could be sentenced to die. You can be sentenced as a juvenile to life without the possibility of parole. Um, this, is, this is our system right now. I'll tell you when Edgar talked about solitary confinement Nearly one third of states have zero limits on how solitary confinement can be used on young people. And one thing to keep in mind is the way these facilities are. Every night that a young person is locked up is trauma. You hear about what Edgar has gone through here about how he describes these young people and they're already traumatized. And now we're re-traumatizing them by incarcerating them. And, and for what? Over 72% of all young people in our country are locked up for nonviolent offenses. So we don't have a crime problem. We have an incarceration problem at this point. And a lot of young people can be incarcerated for uh, technical violations. So these are young people who are serving like are on supervision and make minor things. They cannot go to school, right? They could miss an appointment for a drug test and they could be locked up for that. Right. Um, so this is what we're looking at. And, and I meant, and I remember Edgar talking about the name tags, right? The pink and green, I think he said. Um, in 2017, black youth were 4.6 times as likely as white youth to be locked up. Native American youth were 2.9 times as likely. In California, it's 8.5 times as likely for a black, for a black youth to be locked up. Um, and in some states, it can be as high as 13 times as likely, if not more, I was looking at the stats the other day. Um, and when you talk about being incarcerated in the adult system, black youth are nine times more likely to be sent to the young person, to be sent to the adult system. Um, one in three young people in the juvenile justice system has a disability, right? That qualifies them for special education services. Edgar mentioned his age in a lot of states, there's no minimum age at which a young person can be brought into the system and potentially incarcerated. When I was in, when I was in Baltimore City as a, as a public defender, I remember looking down the hall, there was a little kid, like nine years old, he was in there for stealing a bag of chips. And when you go into court, you have to sort of sign your name saying that you were there. And to see this young, this kid try to hold his pen and like sign his name, that's something that will be ingrained um, in my memory. And Luckily that day, if I remember, he wasn't my client. He wasn't incarcerated, but but he could have been, right? So um, there's at least some some picture.
think you're on mute. I am on mute. Thank you, you too. Um, thank you for that, Dominique. There's so much information to unpack there. It makes me want to ask a lot more questions, but I'll just take note of one thing, which is, you know, you mentioned a third of incarcerated youth are youth with disabilities who qualify for special education. I want to just highlight for our audience so that it doesn't mean that only a third of incarcerated youth have disabilities. Um, youth who are incarcerated are often kids who are never screened for disabilities and therefore are getting marginalized in schools or have disabilities that are just sort of not getting acknowledged by the juvenile justice system. So I think the estimates of how much disability is present or how frequently disability is present when a kid enters the system is over 70%. And then when we factor in the ways in which kids can develop disabilities from severe trauma or from physical abuse or sexual abuse, um, while incarcerated, that number actually goes up. So we're talking about, you know, kids with disabilities very normatively. <sighs> um, uh, so much to unpack. So I wanna move on and ask the two of you, what's the alternative? How do we answer defenders of the juvenile justice system, those who would say it serves some function? What should be in place instead? <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll give it a crack first. I, I think, honestly, From a practical perspective, I think we are city, counties, school districts, and at the state level need to take a proactive approach at, at investing and in a robust uh, infrastructure that provides services that are culturally he and healing informed. And uh, first and foremost, we need it needs to be it needs to be funded, and it, not just for one year. <laughs> or six months or two months or two years, it needs to be an, on an ongoing effort to be continued funding. And it can't be the first thing that gets uh, that gets cut when we're facing a budget budget problem. But, so I, I wanna say that because it's like, a lot of times when we start thinking of like, man, well, what can we be doing? But obviously it's like, I'm thinking of some, when the, la the latest numbers that I saw was when I was in DJJ, it costed around 270 something thousand dollars to incarcerate I have we'll hold one young person at the California Youth Authority at the time. And I, I can not think of like, I mean, I'm at UC Davis right now. And like, what would it look like to have put, put young people in a situation to, in a pathway towards higher education that way? And if it's not higher education, in a pathway towards a vocational setting where they can actually learn either whatever, not just one vocation, but multiple vocations in order to be able to come back. Uh, but I think how we, navigate that it has to be a cultural change within our communities we have to start uh in exploring what vulnerability looks like you know sometimes everybody doesn't want to talk about have these tough conversations you know i know i know that because personally because at my house I, it was one of those things that you didn't talk about you don't talk about your brother being locked up you don't talk about your father being locked up but you got to have these courageous conversations within the, in the house so folks, so within the family, there can be a better understanding. So there needs to be a cultural change as far as that, but also within our community of like, it can't be punitive every, so if you do this, then it results in that. It, there has to be, a, it, again, there has to be that change within our community with the way we think of when a, a young person is put, quote unquote acting out or just actually having a bad day, you know? How do we respond to that? How do we respond to them with, in a way where we're showing up like, well, you're, you might have be having this type of day, then what do you need? Instead of like, this is what we think you need. And it's like engaging them in those conversations and these young people, but really uh, restruct, uh, I don't want to say creating a system, but it's like creating a community where one youth voice is, uh, is something that, that is heard or the family voice is also something that's heard uh, and it's incorporated into whatever happens. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think really, See, going back to some of the, the healing and tradition and restorative practices of like in confronting harm when harm is done in, in a healthy and positive way, not in a punitive way where, again, status, uh, authority is uh, uh, overshadowing that. But And I, and I know I'm talking in, in the very abstract because it's, uh, it's something that I, I, I find myself cha uh, challenged with too, you know, operating within the system and trying to help folks, young people who are navigating probation, 
for alternative education and it's just like trying to come up with the different but it's at the moment is i really believe like we need to start with the cultural change of how we look at this uh, uh how, how we i don't want to say react but how do we act against this punitive system and and put it and place it with something that is based and founded on love compassion um uh, hope and we build from there. And then after that, as long as we're, we're, we're building from a place of love, hope, compassion, and vulnerability, then I think the possibility to create and imagine something beautiful, something that not only just helps our young people, helps the elders, helps everybody in our community, I think then we're in a, in a, in a better place to, uh, to recreate something or, or, you know, or re redevelop something in that way. But uh, I, I don't want to say like, oh, well, I'll build this 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 campus because then it reminds me of like a, 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 a building a prison. But it's like not just having and have like having those conversations to have a cultural change within our community. I'll just say that much. And sorry if I was a little bit too abstract or way out there, y'all. You were great, Edgar, and I'm curious and excited to hear Dominique's Dominique's response to this question as well. What do we replace the current systems with? Sure, and I appreciate you asking. The question, Beth, and and uh, and lucky to live in in LA County and work in LA County, where we have been able to put a little bit more concrete things um, rooted in the values that Edgar talked about. Um, before I dive in, I wanted to to flesh out what what Edgar said, and it's the idea to really hone in on the fact that we can't just talk about these alternatives, we need to. The current system we have is broken and it's not when people talk about trying to protect public safety, this is the recidivism rates are really, really high. Um, and this was a report from 2010, the average state cost for confining a young person is $214,000 a year. 12 states, states spend over $250,000 a year. Um, and there's actually uh, four states that spend over $500,000 a year to incarcerate a young person. Um, and so rooted in the values that Edgar talked about, right? I think on a foundational level, we have to start viewing our young people for, for their potential and viewing their behavior as reactions to things in their lives and circumstances in their lives that they're dealing with. And like Edgar said, instead of punishing, asking, what do you need, right? How can we, how can we support you? And um, so in LA County, one of the things um, our board of supervisors actually passed a motion to try to reimagine. And, and we have to reimagine because we cannot reform our way out of this broken system. We actually have to transform it. And so we have to reimagine what a system that we can create that isn't founded in structural racism, right? That values our young people, right? That, that views where everyone views our black and brown young people with as much value as honestly they view white young people, right? And so in, in Los Angeles County, there's an initiative called Youth Justice Reimagined. And, and it, it does focus, it's this system focused on health, on healing, like Edgar said, on well-being and the positive development of our young people. So here's what it looks like. We were, we were able to draw, there's actually a plan, there's a report on it. So one, when we're talking about the services that Edgar provided, we're calling it a countywide youth development network. So that includes, right, places that can provide, these are specifically called youth and community centers. Right, to provide high quality activities and services, things that will support their social, emotional, cognitive, creative, right, vocational potential for these young people. Um, but these centers are also connected to a 24 hour crisis center. So if something does happen, there is a response that's founded in the community. And part of that response is great is, is we call them youth empowerment and support teams. They're yes teams. So they're teams that um, actually have counselors, right, people who are grounded in restorative justice practices, um, people who have actually had been system impacted, right, and understand what young people are going through. They actually have peer advocates, you can have social workers, and you also have, and you also have people in the, in the, um, who are involved in the court system. And the idea is that when a crisis happens, when something happens, it's these people who will wrap this young person around and their family to sort of check in, see what they can do, and hopefully 
They don't have to be put in the court system. But if they are, they stay with that young person. They develop these authentic relationships. So first of all, from the most basic level, besides supporting these young people, you could help someone like Edgar's mom, or an Edgar himself, who didn't understand what was happening in the court system. And they will walk them through that system. And at every point, decision-making point, they can inform the court, the attorneys about this young person, provide that whole picture about what the young person needs and what will help them to become who we all want them to be in our communities. And so you have these yes teams. And as they go through the court system, again, you want to prioritize providing services in their communities. Uh, there is an acknowledgement that sometimes young people do need to be, <clears throat> may need to be removed from their communities for a short period of time, of course, as short as possible. But you have to completely obliterate this institutional mindset of where we put our young people. So they're called safe and secure healing centers, right? Again, healing is put in there, safe and secure, but they're defined differently, right? So in this case, they're small, they're community-based, they're therapeutic housing. Um, they're home-like, they're as home-like as you could possibly make them. So that means like uh, six young people, and this uh, there are some models, especially like in Pennsylvania, where they're at home, like in a neighborhood, but you are with staff who have different backgrounds, whether it's jobs, recreation, social work, direct personal experience with the system, right? And to again, really support these young people, but again, in a home-like environment. And the idea about the safe and secure, we could have varying levels of security, but when we think about secure, young people feel safe and they feel secure when they feel cared for, right? When they feel respected, when they feel inspired to learn and grow, right? Those are things that you didn't hear Edgar get and that young people don't get when they're locked up. You have that sense of love and attention, right? Um, and so that's sort of the model that we have built in LA County that we are actually currently trying to implement right now and really get the funding for, right? The county has committed to doing this. And so now it's not the what, but it's the how, right? And so when Edgar talked about reallocating dollars, right? It's moving money away from these punitive systems and these lockups, which I told you how expensive they are and moving them into building up this, this network in our communities. Beautiful. What an incredible program, Dominique. So let me ask you both, if you were, let's talk about law and policy, which is certainly one of our strong interests in the civics project. Um, if you were thinking about, you know, which concrete laws or policies you needed to create or which you needed to abolish or, you know, sort of take apart and reconstruct, what would be your priorities? Maybe one or two from each of you, the laws you'd most like to do away with or the laws you'd most likely, most like to create or change? I'll go, I think I can go first. I think my three laws, if I'm thinking of like having to, to do away with, um, I, I definitely would have to say that the um, status offenses, which only impact minors. And uh, again, Dominic said, and then like one of the main reasons why a lot of young people are incarcerated today. And those consist of uh, truancy, uh, like being charged for truancy, uh, violating your probation, being out past curfew, those type of things, uh, doing away with those for sure. Uh, second, uh, a real big one for me, is, I think it's uh, these enhancements. Uh, a lot of the times these, uh, these gang enhancements that, uh, that really impact, disproportionately impact young people of color, black, brown, indigenous uh, young people, we got it, we really got to revisit that and how we label our young people because it's, you can have potentially a, a two year, your, your controlling charge can have two years. However, the enhancement can carry anywhere from two, four, eight, 10, 15 to life, right? And uh, as far as the, the adjunct to the, to, to the controlling case, so doing really looking at uh, enhancements and, uh, and ending the whole thing of uh, charging young people as adults, ending that. That those three, I would say if, if, I, were, if I were to th thinking from a law and policy, perspective, those three would be in that order. That's how I would tackle them. Thank you. You know, Edgar and I, I support all of the things he said, right? But um, I think one of the big overlaps is ending the ability to transfer a kid into the adult system. That is one of the worst, if not worst things that you can do to a young person. Um, and I know far too many people 
who were actually, I mean, Edgar was able to stay in the juvenile system, who were sent to the adult system. Um, so I would certainly end that. Um, another thing as far as policies go is the way that the state or counties invest our money, right? So it's investing. So it's really reallocating dollars um, away from these carceral systems, away from these prisons, and again, really focusing on on community based on community based services. Um, and there's a lot of efforts. Uh, what's nice is the things that Edgar and I are talking about are things that we are and have been working on in, in California. Um, and the other thing that actually came into mind is, you know, I talked about needing to transform instead of reform, but that doesn't happen overnight, right? So a lot of these things are. Or how do you how do you adjust the system that we know it right now? And one of the things is really trying to shrink the number of young people who are caught up in this system, and and therefore like at risk of incarceration. Right? I mentioned earlier how seventy percent of our of our young people are incarcerated for nonviolent offenses, and so one of the things um, is at least in California, there are certain, one of the things you try to do is called diversion, which is when a young person is charged with a crime, can we support them? Can we supervise them? Can we outside of the court system, right? And sometimes there are restrictions on which, based on charge, right? Based on young people who can have that opportunity. So one of the things that I would do is expand the number of young people who can actually have that opportunity um, to be supported um, and have their cases resolved outside the formal court system. But that also means going back to the investment is really investing in resources that can help support uh, these young people. Thank you. Um, for people who wanna keep learning about any of the subjects we've been talking about today, youth justice, youth incarceration related policy, uh, transformative approaches, is there a book that you would recommend? I'll pose this question to Edgar. Uh, definitely. Y'all, I'm gonna bust out my whole library on y'all right now. But uh, I definitely, it's not just one book because I can't, I'm very indecisive, but I'm gonna give y'all some these top five books that really kind of like kicked it off for me and I'll share them with y'all. It's one is called Inferno. It's by Robert A. Ferguson and it's An Anatomy of American Punishment. This one really just kind of kicked off a lot of different things for me. Um, uh, one by Alex Vitali, it's called The End of Policing, and it talks about just the whole concept of just policing within their communities. And, and every, and again, before I get into the last comments, uh, Until We Reckon, Violence, Mass Incarceration, A Road to Repair by Daniel Daniel Serrer, I think, really good too. And my last two, it's, the last one's called Locked In, uh, The True Causes of Mass Incarceration and How to Achieve Real Reform. It's a really good. And the last one that I think provides a foundation as to far who, who's getting incarceration is called the poverty industry, the exploitation of America's most vulnerable citizens. Uh, I think if, if, if I were to say like one out of all of them, for sure read the end of policing or the poverty industry, but every single book provides a different perspective uh, to, uh, to what's happening. Every, every author uh, has a different outlook on what's happening within the, uh, what's going on with mass incarceration looking at the DA and how you're, they're charging people, looking at what, what type of uh, policies are impacting uh, uh, predominantly black and brown communities, or even just like the whole component of like of poverty and how it impacts our communities, right? And, and how our folks are funneled through that in, into like uh, met basically into being incarcerated. But again, that's like a part of my library. I mean, uh, I got so many more. And it's like, every time I go to the back and look at who, the reference list and that takes me at, at different places, you know, and uh, still, still need to read more and more, but those are some of my books. Uh, hopefully I took those and I'll, I'll drop it in the chat in a bit too. Yeah, I, I will say uh, Edgar is always a person to <laughs> go to for book recommendations. I remember one of my first conversations with him years ago, I ended up with like my little reading list <laughs> by Edgar too, so. <laughs> That's beautiful. I'm definitely sensing a future professor. Um, Dominique and Edgar, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we break, I want to ask if there are ways that our listening audience might be able to support your work. Do you have projects or campaigns people can volunteer with or support or donate to? We'd just love to hear any suggestions. 
Yeah, I, uh, so, I'll go. Go, go ahead. ahead. Go, go, go. Now, I, I'll just say uh, at the top of my head, no, but y'all can please follow us uh, at meetbycollective.org. That's our website. I'll drop it in the chat box right now. Follow our social medias, uh, either on Instagram. You, We have a cool thing called the Milpa Show on YouTube. It shows just a lot of the different work that's going on, a uh, different perspective of what everyone's doing within our, our community-based organization, but also uh, our Facebook and Instagram. That Those are the ones that kind of got everything going on. And uh, besides just overall, y'all just, I think a way to just get involved, not just necessarily with us, but just being able to, one, willing to listen and, and, and kind of sit, sit with some discomfort and approach those conversations. Uh, sometimes they're not going to be easy within our community, specifically around uh, incarceration, and and see how we just can meet up and challenge and challenge the other narrative as well. Because it is a narrative campaign, it, it is a narrative battle of uh, that's going on, and they're always going to try to portray young people as bad. But uh, follow us on YouTube, all that stuff, y'all, on social media. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you, Edgar. Uh, Dominique, anything that you'd like to add? Sure. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to connect and it might be um, emailing Beth or I could put my email address in because we definitely need support on a number of campaigns that beautiful vision. Uh, you just as we imagine LA County, we are mobilizing on the ground to try to make sure that it actually gets the investment and the resources um, that it needs. And so it, it is a battle right now. It's like we have the win. So much of our work is we can get the quote unquote win and then it's all about implementation. Right? How do we make this happen? And so LA County, that's certainly a fight. Um, and then there are some bills that CDF is, is always working on. Um, and we always need um, support, especially from constituents for um, calling their legislators um, and, and other ways that if there are organizations too that wanna get involved. Um, just an example of some of the things we have done in the past and some we're working on now is we did actually establish a minimum age uh, for juvenile system in California. So except for very specific offenses, if you're under 12, you can't get put into the system, right? But Edgar and I have been working for four years now to try to end uh, the use of, uh, he mentioned OC spray. So it's colloquially called pepper spray, but it is far more powerful and harmful than, than the, commercially, the commercial pepper spray. And Edgar can tell you they sometimes shoot them out as pellets. Um, like huge sprays there. So we've been trying and it's really hard. This is how hard it is. We've been trying for over four years now to, to ban it. And we're not, and we're not there yet. Um, so that's a bill that we're actually still pushing right now. Um, and then we also focus on reinvestment. So there's a bill that uh, I'm working on with a number of organizations that's trying to really get a hundred million dollar funding stream in California. Um, annually to support sort of upstream investments in, in communities and non-law enforcement agencies. So I think the best way is either, I don't know, Beth, if it's through you or I can put my email address in so that if people want to get involved, they can certainly reach out and I'm happy to touch base. Absolutely. Um, our audience members also have a couple of questions for us. Earlier, someone asked, why can't youth be bailed out? Why is there no bail uh, for youth in the juvenile justice system? Um, so we're... The juvenile court system is just set up differently than the adult system. It's interesting, you don't have jury trials, right? You, you, you do still have, because of the consequences have become more severe, you do have a, you know, an assigned attorney. If you need one, you do have the prosecutor. So a lot of it looks like um, uh, what you would typically see of an adult criminal trial, but because it was originally set up differently than the adult system, um, one of the big differences is no jury and you can't post bail. So the decision is, is completely up to the judge. Thank you. So we've covered so much ground and I also still have a lot of questions. Sadly though, we're out of time. So Dominique and Edgar, um, just, you know, I really don't have words. So much gratitude for the work you're doing, so much gratitude for the clarity that you've both brought to today's conversation. Uh, I'm really so, um, so just appreciative that you were able to join us today and hope that uh, your words will re reach a much wider audience. We'll definitely distribute the episode and invite audience members to share it as you listen. Um, I also wanna just, uh, for our listening audience who can't see our Zoom chat, uh, Edward, Edgar uh, referenced his um, organization, MILPA, 
The spelling of that is M-I-L-P as in Peter A. And you can find them at milkbuckcollective.org. So for those listening by audio or watching later on video, that's how you can follow. I want to invite everyone to join us next episode uh, for our session on the Food and Drug Administration. We've been hearing a lot about the FDA and FDA approvals. So that's our next focus, and we should have the rest of our September calendar up soon. Again, thank you so much to our audience and to Edgar and to Dominique and to the Children's Defense Fund of California and to Milpa. Take care, everybody. Thank you.